you've got to start developing those disciplines in those areas at the very beginning. So one book is all on saving, one is all on giving, and the other one is the staying out of debt. So those are all specific areas that you really have to learn. So you, I was in New York on a you, business trip, selling my bag, doing deals, and I was, what I thought, doing it. And all of a sudden, I get the call. Paris fell off her uncle's back, and we're in the hospital right now. So I had a choice to make, family or career. Like if you haven't practiced and developed the skills, you're not gonna be successful at it. So there's two different ways you can get there. The Lord is orchestrating unexpected acts and showering you with his delightful surprises. That's good. Amen. Hi, welcome to the Abundant Life Podcast. <laughs> Where your fancified host, Charles Todd, will be talking with me, his fantastic wife on how in the hell we got here from there. Here we go. Welcome to your best life, babe. Well, we're talking today about how we went from being broke as a joke to being flipping loaded. How do you do that? <laughs> how did you do it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It was a lot of that. Seriously. Yeah, like... Definitely a lot of prayer. And I mean, you know, I think one thing, you know, that we've got out of this whole thing of being completely bankrupt and we'll go through and talk about this being completely bankrupt nothing no bank accounts no cars no place to live i mean nothing and then even coming out of bankruptcy you still have irs back payments and student loans so you're not really starting out equal you're still underground so the people that we've helped you know a lot of times i hear we don't know what i'm going through and it's like True, yeah it's like i always ask them do you got a job well, yeah. Or do you have a car? Or do you have a bank account? Or do you have a place to live? If you had one of those things, one of those, you had more than what we had starting out. So we can relate to the compassion. This whole journey has brought us to where we're at today is why we've created the book series, Money, Mike and the Gang, as far as to teach parents how to teach their kids on how to be raised with in a wealthy environment and with some basic biblical principles to help them to be rich. Period, because that was the whole start of what put us in where we got. Can you being imagine broke. <laughs> if we had this as kids? I mean, just the, just the little things, right? Just the little things of, and I thank you for digging into scripture and finding out the biblical way on how to do this. Because when we did have absolutely nothing, we had nowhere to go but up. <laughs> <laughs> That's the good thing about being completely rock bottom. <laughs> you just get a dollar, you're doing better. Hey, yay. Boo -boo, boo -boo. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is that, you know, it's really, it's pretty simple. It's pretty basic once you do get some of the principles, but if you don't have them, you're going to get to the snot beat out of you. Well, let period. me ask you this. And I know you just talked about, okay, when we had nothing, it was this, but what was the turning point for you? Because we were running and gunning, especially when you own nightclubs. <laughs> I mean, we were like living life in the fast lane and it was like hyper consumption. Crazy. We lived a crazy life. If you look back and I mean, I was yeah. pregnant on the dance floor at your second nightclub opening and I was nine months pregnant. <laughs> that explains everything. <laughs> and I know that we were living large. We lost basically everything. And then we had to move back home. But what was the turning point for you where you said, we have to do something different. Like what everybody has their defining moment. What was yours? Losing the stuff wasn't really that big of a deal because I think that I always knew like in the back of my mind, I could get stuff back again. Like from a business perspective is like, once you learn how to operate within a business or you learn how to make money to earn money and there's a distinction between making and earning if you're making it then you're committing basically fraud because you're counterfeiting <laughs> so earning is a whole different thing <laughs> okay wait <laughs> that's a whole other subject <laughs> making and earn that's interesting never thought of it that nobody way nobody makes money only the federal reserve and it's whoever i think they do the coins and the other one does the right. bills 
they make money. Right. So if you're making money, you're counting for the money. <laughs> you earn money. You earn money. You That's earn money good. I by like providing that. a I service like a or a product to somebody and they buy that. Or you are an employee of a company who provides a service or a product, period. Right. So you earn money. So in the back of my mind, going back, in the back of my mind, I always knew that I would come up with something to earn more money again. So it wasn't that big of a deal. Really? Okay. So, but that's like a deep ingrained rooted thing. So what brought that? Like you, it's almost like you had a reserve back there. Like it didn't matter the stuff cause it would come and go. What's that? How did that reserve get there? Can, do you even know? A lot of it's like, you know, how people are surrounded by their upbringing and their parents and what they had gone through. I think that's a mindset that I had. So I, I had ingrained for me from the time that I was third grade to work. When I came home from school, I, immediately went to work. I worked until dinner time. After dinner, I went back to work and then eight or nine o'clock at night, I stopped working and I went to bed and I went to school and I came home each and every day. And I did that on the weekdays and I did that on the weekends. And you were in third grade. So how old was that? Nine, 10, eight, nine, yeah, eight, whatever. Nine. So you Didn't worked at eight and nine. So I worked. So I, I learned how to work and I don't know today. I think that's a missing concept almost in some kid's life. The yeah. concept of working? concept of working, yeah. Because we don't want to shelter them. And it's like, you don't even want to let them walk to school anymore. It's like, you <laughs> can't ride a bike. You got to be driven and dropped off at school. It's like, yeah, you know, the there's things. there's a lot of crazy things that have evolved since then. So, Well, of course, but that doesn't mean that you can't still teach a kid how to work by doing chores or whatever else those things may right. be. I mean, me and my cousin were mowing lawns at eight years old, going and knocking on doors like soliciting child labor, hey, whatever, you know, <laughs> soliciting candy neighbors and house and candy to work, right? To make money. We were learning that. And that, so that was on. your reserve then was that working stage at such a young age. There's always, there's always a way to earn money in the back of my mind. So it wasn't a thing. What was the turning point is losing your wife, your daughter, and your family. That was a turning point. Cause then it was like, I'm going to try not to cry all the stuff, you know, it's like, I can get stuff back. I can get another car. I can get another house. I can know whatever I can get another of that. But it's like the one thing going through multiple step parents of both my mom and my dad's side and being raised by step parents who weren't really what I would classify as the best, <laughs> just the best, the easiest well, way to say you know, it. And they're, they're trying to do what they're trying to do. We've all had step parents, so. My experience with step parents was that I didn't ever want my child to have step parents. Right. That was one of my goals is that I was going to remain married and I was never going to let my daughter have to go through having step parents. And all of a sudden at the age of one in her life, I'd already failed. <laughs> It was done. It was like, I didn't make it a year hardly. And what brought us to that was having to move back in your parents, having nothing, the financial stress that is basically just floods over every area of your life. You know, when you can't pay your bills, when you can't even buy diapers for your baby, can't buy food for your baby. It's like that puts a lot of stress on a marriage. Not only does it put you know, stress on a marriage, but stress is the number one killer of people with health related problems. And stress is usually the, the root of heart disease and all these other things. And stress is the root of that. So that financial perspective, just, it just like, dread, it, like I said, it floods every area of your life. It covers up everything. It suppresses, it puts everything in bondage. So there can be so much. And you know, that's one of the things I've learned just in churches that the number two prayer request is for healing and finances. Amazing, <laughs> so that, just, right? that just tells you how big of the problem it is, not just in the world, but in the church, 70% of prayers are those two topics. And so that tells me there's a really big problem, not just in the world, but in the church as well too. But then they also don't want to talk about money. So nobody actually ever really gets healed in that department in church is and healing money. too, which is why we, when, okay, now it makes sense of, you know, who's preaching on money. And being raised pretty much in the church, you know, as a child. And even when we were, you know, when I was in the nightclub business, we we're still going to church <laughs> you know, every oh my Sunday. God, were we? <laughs> yeah. Scottsdale. Burr, burr. We're Hallelujah. Still, still burr, going to church, burr, burr. but you're not learning the things that are actually going to set you free and deliver you. You're not learning 
the grace of God. You're not learning. I'm not saying we weren't learning in the places we were going to church. We weren't hearing anything about, you know, really anything regarding finances. Maybe once a year you hear something on tithing or giving, you know, and then maybe every once in a while you hear something on how Jesus healed or something, but you're not being taught those scriptures that are going to help you get miraculous healing, going to help you stay in health, going to help you in the areas of your finance. I mean, Jesus talked more about money than he talked about any other subject. How did you say, okay, well, this isn't happening with where we're at. This made a decision. Okay. I've done it this way and I failed multiple times because I had my GNC vitamin stores that were successful in the way of making or earning money but I was unsuccessful in the way of managing I like the business. You, you actually attributed making because were you doing some shady stuff with GNC? I could have been. <laughs> making money? <laughs> I was earning money. Well, the, the, the store was making, I was earning, so whatever. <laughs> I was able to make the store successful that I had. I was able to do that when I was in college with the corporate stores. I was able to do that with my own franchise, which is why I went from the, fr the corporate to the franchise because I saw that I was able to manage these stores, multiple stores, and be successful. Okay. So why not do it on my own? I'd always been, wanted to be my own boss. I'd always been my own boss before I even was in college, but I was in that system of college, which gave me a systematic mindset where I actually work for somebody instead of doing my own thing, which is a whole nother subject <laughs> on its own. Go, we can go on for a long time about that. But the point is, is that I was successful in running a business. I was unsuccessful in managing the money and the inventory and all those things. Because once again, I wasn't taught those things. Very so interesting. That, so even though you can have you can have revenue streams that are abundance and doing good, the mismanagement of those streams will cause you to go broke. That's true, and that's what happened. So, well, myth, yeah, mis, mismanagement from the perspective of when I switched from doing those to going into the nightclub business, I didn't properly exit that business in a way that could have been prosperous because I didn't know, once again, uneducated. I mean, Hosea 4 and 6 says that lack of knowledge, that, that, that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, basically means that bad things are gonna happen because you're stupid. That's the <laughs> CT version of that scripture right there, period. CT amplified. So you've gotta have some, you've gotta have some knowledge and that comes from the form, I mean, today with everything that we have, I mean, right here in, in, in the palm of your hand, all the knowledge that you can get. And the Bible says in, I think it's Proverbs 4 and 7, that wisdom is the principal thing and all you're getting, get understanding. Right. When the wisdom is different, wisdom is something that you get from God. The Bible says that we have the wisdom of God in the mind of Christ. I mean, that's amazing right there to me. But you still have to do something to apply that. You still have to get some knowledge as well too, so you can do that. And I was just sending an email to our daughter this morning. She's making a decision with some investments and some other things. And I told her just that. I said, if you don't have the knowledge in this area, that's okay, but surround yourself. I think it's Proverbs 18 and 11 or something like that. You can put it in the footnotes of this, that it says that uh, in abundance of counsel, there's a victory. Yeah. So my point to her was that it's okay not to have the knowledge in this, but don't make a decision without having the knowledge Go use your agency, use the in-house legal. If they're not able to do that, use your own attorney. Get the counseling so that you can make the decision to have a victory. And so the point is, is that we've got to get that counsel. And it can come in a lot of forms away. It can come through the teachings that we got through Creflo Dollar Ministries for Jesse Duplantis, Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Sabell, all the people that we surrounded ourselves in and that we took all their teachings in these subjects. And what that starts to do is that starts to create knowledge for you. You start to get understanding of what the Bible says. When you hear something from somebody who has also had success, that was the most important thing to me as well too. I don't want to hear from an accountant or a wealth manager who's broke. I don't want to go be trained by some guy in the gym who's a hundred pounds overweight. If he doesn't have enough respect for himself to do what he's trying to tell me, what he's trying to tell him to sell me, I want nothing to do with it. Man. I want a personal trainer who's in great shape. I want a wealth manager who's wealthy and rich. I want all those things. So the same thing. I wanted to hear teachings from pastors, ministers, organizations, whatever it was from guys that were rich. And it's amazing because it's so taboo in the church to have money. 
that whole message of prosperity. And I mean, you could go from town to town, just like anything. You put, if you put it out there, people are going to come against it. And if it's good, I mean, people will criticize Jesus for walking on the water, you know, showboating. Oh, he, you know, whatever thinks he's the son of God. And, you know, you could find a hundred different things wrong with Jesus walking on the water. But the fact is it was a miracle and he believed God and he was God. And so it's the same thing with rich pastors is where I'm getting at. And if you don't believe in having a rich pastor, then I think for some people they need to reconsider because like, again, like you're saying, would you go to a fat and broke wealth manager and, and trainer? No. You want to go to the ones who are actually living a successful life. And I think that people who don't have that mentality of seeing things that way, I mean, everybody sees things differently, you know, preachers are supposed to be broke. Well, then how are you ever going to prosper supernaturally if you think that preachers are, are just supposed to be broke their whole life? And I think we were raised that way in a lot of ways. I mean, I was born and raised in the Catholic church, sit down, stand up, fight, fight, fight. It was like, okay, you know, there was a lot of, um, layers of religion there and then you were beat over the head with the bible in the baptist church so you know like digging through and then my mom was new age you know with her crystals and candles and all these other things and how we came together to just peel back that stuff to have real breakthrough i think is something for people to open their eyes and just see uh, just a different perspective on if you want to prosper then i would say take the advice or take the nuggets of grace from those individuals and then make it your own. Well, I think one of the things that restrict people from really getting what the Bible has to say is traditions and rules. And that's what religion is made up of traditions and rules. So you get all these denominations creating all these different rules and these guys think this and they think this, and it's all these different types of stuff, but it's their traditions and rules that hold people back like the Pharisees, right? They were the only ones that could have the anointing of God that kept all the people in bondage. And who did Jesus call the brood of vipers? <laughs> the Pharisees. He didn't himself. call the people sinning. <laughs> he didn't call like the devil a brood of viper. He called the religious people <laughs> the religious that. religious leaders. I mean, come on, get a revelation of that. Right. I mean, so, um, you know, part of what I think that's giving some people in the world of faith, if you will, or the pastors, a bad name is there's been people who have taken advantage of church people or of churches and yeah, have embezzled money. In every group. It's not just churches everywhere. Correct. There's, there's doctors that commit, commit malpractice. There's attorneys that do shady stuff, whatever. There's going to be a bad apple in every bunch, but you can't not say, well, I'm never going to go to the doctor. I'm never going to use an attorney because of this guy or that. So I'm never going to go to church. I'm never going to believe a guy who talks on prosperity because of that. You can't do that. Okay. And Going back to what I said earlier, if 70% of prayer requests are for healing and finances, then why wouldn't you want to get information on finances? Why would you talk against somebody speaking about finances? Then, so then people say, well, money's the root of all evil. Well, they've misquoted that verse out of 1 Timothy. It's right. the love of money. Right. It's the wrong relationship with money. It's not money. Money, money is pretty much neutral. So it depends on money is an amplifier. So if you put money into the hand of a man who is diligent and is a good guy and gives and takes care of his money. It's going to amplify that. He's going to give more. He's going to be more generous. He's going to do more investing. If you put it in somebody's hand that's stupid and broke and a drug dealer or whatever, they're going to buy more drugs. They're going to create more evil. They're going to do more of the bad stuff that they're already doing. It's just the amplifier of what you already have. Yeah. That's why when people win the lottery who are broke, who have no money managing skills, it amplifies the brokenness right. is why they end up bankrupt right. again because right. they have lack of knowledge. Right. And so what happens? It destroys them. So it's really understanding what money is, how money is to be used, um, the benefits of that, because you know, the whole thing that we've set our nonprofit, our ministry up is under Genesis 12 and two is blessed to be a blessing. Right. Like once you learn it, then, share it with somebody. And that's what we're doing right now. We're sharing that we're spending our resources we, to, to build studio sets and cameras and editing and all the people that help Creating us to do IP all this type of stuff that we've spent years. We're going on 17 years in our ministry. Resources. Now we've been doing, you know, we did the old abundant life that we had for over two and a half years, how much money we spent every year 
with, we're not taking a sour, we're not doing anything, I'm not tuning our own horn, this is basically, um, you know, sharing our testimony. And Revelation says we overcome him, him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, the word of a testimony. Our testimony has great power. It has great power in delivering people, setting people free, prospering people, and that's what we're doing. Right now, we're giving a testimony, because right. it brings power. And the thing that's so great about that, it puts the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb side by side. That's amazing that the testimony would be in the same seat, the same arena as the blood of Jesus. That's, That's good. big. That's powerful. Ooh, so we're, we're, thick. we're testifying on that to do that. And we're spending our resources because we want to bless others with what we've experienced and how we did it. How do we do it? Because that was my whole thing. How do I do it? You well, know? So and then how the books is then what we did is then, okay, how do we not have our daughter go through the same crap that we went through. So at age eight, we started her out as an employee of our corporation, paying income taxes, investing, all that stuff that we were never taught. We started at age eight. So from age eight to now she's 25, this whole period of time that we've had in order to train her. And she's our case study. Everything is why we can now write these books and how we can now get back. Because like I said earlier, if I'm going to listen to somebody, they better be doing preaching doing what they're preaching so or they better do so, like, okay so it's like my dad used to always say do like i say not like i do well the opposite of that <laughs> so that's why so i say well how do like i do and like i say <laughs> how are you two qualified to teach on this how are you qualified to speak into people's lives how are you qualified to teach teachers parents grandparents whoever about how to raise kids from a perspective of making them rich i would love to bring on um the people that we have testimonies with, even in the church that have had miracles, healings, um, healing of cancers that we've experienced. Um, you and Paris, like traveling to third world countries and delivering a leg from freaking California all the way to Ash, Kyrgyzstan and, and like restoring this man's livelihood. Um, the miracles of sowing seeds into ministries and giving words where they came back years later and said to you personally, you gave me a word back then. I thought you were crazy and it came to pass and here's my life right now and I'm, my marriage is restored, my family is restored and so, and even with the 10 week financial courses that you were teaching, that whole thing was just a crazy experience. So I want you to talk a little bit about the day you're outside in a chair, reading a book, you were gaining knowledge, like you said, with get wisdom and all your wisdom, get understanding. I asked you, how did you do it? How did it happen? You were reading your favorite book outside on the patio one day, just whatever, enjoying the afternoon. And all of a sudden you, you, you got the word. So when we were still in Newport beach, you and Paris were out shopping, spending the money. That's no more. <laughs> I was studying. How do I, get I earn the money? My I, wife spends the money. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jesus, I need to get some more money because those women are spitting it all out there. Dear five but, pounds, seven <laughs> ounce baby Jesus. <laughs> My wife and child are out shopping right now. <laughs> Will you help me? So yeah, I was just, I was reading The Laws of Prosperity by Kenneth Copeland and I was just having this conversation with the Lord and he says, I want you to, that was before COVID. So he's like, I want you to share more on finances with the body of Christ. And I was like, I'm not qualified. And I heard silence. <laughs> when I never... But why did you think that you weren't qualified? That's a good question. You know, it wasn't that I lacked confidence in my own life, but I guess, you know, stepping onto uh, a stage, if you will, of teaching other people in the church or some other type of platform is just like, I don't know, maybe it's just the enemy trying to hold me back. I don't know, lack of confidence, I guess. Um, and so anytime that I know, like when the Lord tells me something and I say something, I hear silence, I know that what I just said was really dumb. Because <laughs> he doesn't go, you big old dummy. Uh-oh, but so maybe I should be silent just, more often. He's just quiet. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, try that. <laughs> See how far that gets you. So that, then I knew that, okay, what I just said was wrong. And so I said, okay, tell you what. I am not going to go looking for this. I'm not going to put this together. If you want me to do this, you bring the opportunity to me. I love that. This is Saturday afternoon, next day in church. Long story short is one of the leaders and that basically uh, was the manager over all these different groups that they had. These 10 word groups came up and said, Hey, I'm just talking to, you know, some of the other people and we want you to lead a 10 week financial class. <laughs> 
But I was the silent next, the next, next day. day. Yeah, less than 24 hours. And I was silent. She's like, do you hear what I said? <laughs> you know? I'm just thinking, Lord, you got some sense of humor. <laughs> and so anyway, we did it. You know, and I said, here's, here's my, I didn't answer right then. I said, let me think about it. Came back and I said, here's, you know, here's my guidelines in order to do this. I, I, want, I want to be able to do this my way. I right. want to be able to use the teachings of all the people that I've used. I want to be able to take your curriculum and basically tweak it Chew into, it and yeah, spit it back out. and tweak it into, I'll use basically the, the foundation of it, but I want to insert all my own information that I've had from all the mentors that I've had, because for me to teach something, it's got to come from the heart. Right. It's got to come. I'm not going to take somebody's book who I don't agree with and teach somebody because it's not going to be authentic. It's not going to do anybody any good. Right. It's like being in, it's like being great, in college and <laughs> taking well, a textbook like, and then it's like being in great trying shape trying to teach. Like you've worked out for 20 years, you've eaten right all for 20 years and you've, you've got this great physique. And then this gym wants to hire you and they say, here's what we want you to teach them. They can eat donuts and they can eat this and they don't have to work out. Just walk on the treadmill for a little bit. And you know, it's like, it's not, it's not right. right. <laughs> you know? So anyway, through, you know, that class, like you said, we experienced all kinds of miracles, people, not us, but the people who were teaching. Well, I think we did too. I think what was miraculous for me was actually seeing you open up to people. That was like, okay, wow. I had never seen that side of you before. You were so adamant against, remember I used to always say that what you're adamant against is what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's your fault. This <laughs> is all, everything here is your fault. I blame you. <laughs> I know what you do in a marriage. <laughs> That's my fault for everything. I take the blame. And then that opened up then when COVID hit and we were in the middle of our, I think, like the ninth week of our second time of doing that and COVID hit and everything got shut down. Right. But let me go back. So I want to share my experience of watching you because I was a little nervous at first. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be nervous about me getting in front of people too. <laughs> you don't know it's going to come out. <laughs> Cause I was always camera facing. And so when you were going to go camera facing and stand up on stage and deliver what you were so adamant against because you didn't like me in that position, you didn't. Mm -hmm. So I'm okay with it now. you're okay with it now, but it took 25 years. Well, it's, I got over it. when you got to the place where you were in front of the camera, you're like, okay, I'm fine now. Is this marriage counseling it's, now? It could be. <laughs> Stay tuned for the next episode. <laughs> we just went from financial <laughs> discussion to wah, wah, wah. marriage counseling. <laughs> like, you SOB, you did this to me back then. You had 25 years. I'm bad. <laughs> Cachetadas. <laughs> anyway, so here we are. So I was a little um, skeptical. At first, I was upset <laughs> because I thought, well, you're okay with this now because you're into it, so now it makes it okay. Well, I mean, it's something completely <laughs> different when... You have you, to come into agreement. That's another thing. Well, it's, I think if you're trying to do something that maybe you're not gifted or talented in, you're trying to force something, like you maybe haven't created the skills to do a certain like a sport or whatever it may be like if you haven't practiced and developed the skills you're not going to be successful at it well i think that i don't necessarily totally believe that i think but that let's, you'll let's, be, let's, okay. let's listen let's listen where i'm going so there's two different ways you can get there one you can develop the skills to like be a good athlete be a good speaker whatever you practice it the other one is to be anointed in order to do it right so my point is is that when you have when you have something in your heart, like for me, I'd spent years filling up, filling up, filling up, filling up. What I mean by that is listening to teachings for, you know, over 15, 20 years, listening to, you know, two, three, four, five teachings a day, Right. you know, still doing that today. I mean, some people go to church and they get 20 minutes of a sermon and that's all they get all week. And it's like, I literally listen to a message in the morning. I listen to one or two when I'm working out. We listen to when we go to bed. It's like, that's just the way that I do it because it's funny. You, 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 gotta, you gotta think of it from the perspective of 
if you have this, like, just picture this as a pitcher and you just keep filling it up and you keep filling it up and you keep filling it up and you keep filling it up. At some point it starts to run over. Right. And when you get to that point, when you're full and you start to run over, that's when other people can get the benefit of what you have put into yourself from a spiritual perspective. That's the getting back. Right. It's like the cup running over in Psalms right. 20. You can't 24. give out of a half empty glass. So you can't give out of a, out of a, you know, or half if you're, full, whatever it is. Yeah. That's the whole, whole you know, that, Unless someone that tips it over. worldly <laughs> saying. God, God will usually tip it over and make you overflow. <laughs> you know, the, they try to, the world tries to make that saying, look at your, you at your cup half full. That's supposed to be good. To me, that's bad. Because <laughs> cup half full? What the heck am I going to do with a half full cup of something? Because if I'm thirsty, I take a drink, done. Right. But if my cup's running over... I can drink and drink and drink and I can, other people can put their cups underneath my cup mm -hmm. to get a drink too, or to get what it is they need. Right. That's so, good. Like so the whole, whole point is that once you're full, then you're just able to flow with other people. And you're that's what I was flow experiencing. With yeah. And it wasn't nothing there. with me. I didn't polish my speaking techniques. I didn't stand in front of a camera or something and practice any, I didn't do any of that. You know, I've been to like Africa and preached. <laughs> um, when I wasn't even know that I was Your going to, trip, that's, but I still, that's crazy. still did. I mean, there's been certain times, but I was never like in a position where I had to do this structure type of thing. So anyway, it came from a place of abundance. Okay. So let's talk about your Africa trip. Oh, please. <laughs> well, okay. So you've been to lots of different countries to preach the gospel, which is pretty crazy because when you're like, oh, I don't know, not... preach, but to, you did, they were like, Hey, we brought you here. So get well, up on the stage. And that was like, one what? time. A lot of the other times, you know, Mexico, Kyrgyzstan, those type of stuff, Ministry you, work. you preach in a format where you're not actually standing in front of people and teaching or preaching or whatever you want to consider it. It's humanitarian you're, work. You're doing something like delivering the leg, you right. know, with my parents doing that. It's like, you're sharing the gospel out of love. And then you talk to somebody like, why did you do this? Why did you come all the way? Hey man, I just did it because, you know, it's an opportunity God told me to, and here I am, you know, and it's like people got, gosh, this person would do something like this for no compensation or no reward. And other than love is the reward. Yeah. And that's the message right there to them. That's the preaching, <laughs> you know, right. the preaching is your actions, right. you know, that's the going to Mexico, South America and building people houses or whatever and providing them a house, going and mucking out people's houses after hurricanes and they're not even helping you. They're down the street and they're like, why are these people doing this? You know, that's, that's a message all in itself right there. So, I mean, that's what Jesus said. The poor you will always have. Something, <laughs> you'll something always like have with you. It's the like poor. you're always going to have people in need Brutal. basically. So, you know, how do you minimize that? Well, through knowledge, teachings. Well, and this so that your children can grow up to understand that when you plant these little seeds, it will grow like the trees, the leaves on this tree, that you can then be a blessing. Like you said, Genesis 12 and 2, we're blessed to be a blessing. So when you're in the overflow with your cup running over, you can walk in love and take so, care of people. So let's go back to the beginning. Okay. Okay. So we're broke, busted, disgusted <laughs> coming out of it. I don't want to go back to the beginning. <laughs> so I set out for new business opportunities. Um, Somehow, I don't know how I came up with enough money to buy a car. And so I left being with your, you and your parents and went from California to the East coast was working and basically lived out of my car. So I still didn't have a bank account. I still didn't cause I couldn't put money in the bank because the IRS would seize my money anytime I do anything. So I still couldn't have a bank account. still didn't have a place to live, had I was working on a deal. So I was getting some money through what we were raising money and whatever. So, but I'm living out of my car. How long did you live out of your car? A mm, year or so at least. So, and sometimes staying in a hotel, sometimes staying with business associates, that type of stuff. Did so, they know you were living out of your car? I don't think so. No, they oh. thought I was, they always probably thought I was staying in a hotel. Gosh, I wonder if like, even if you spoke to Harold now, you said, Hey, you remember that time? He has yeah, no, no idea you were living out of your car. No, absolutely not. Edgerton or any of those guys. No, nope, absolutely not. Oh my God. So anyway, that was, I didn't know. That I didn't was the know time until recently. Yeah. That's no big deal. Anyway, <laughs> you know, almost it is a car. big deal. Yeah. People do that all over the place now. So it's like, well, okay, go on. <laughs> <laughs> so 
the whole time, I'm 100% believing that we're gonna get back together. That's my goal, get back together with you and to basically restore our relationship and our family so that we can raise our daughter together. I don't want my daughter growing up with a stepdad or in a broken family or anything like that. So that was the number one goal. What brought us back together was Paris was with me messing around with one of my friends, fell off his back and cracked her skull. I remember that. So <laughs> she's in the hospital. She's got multiple skull fractions. She's got bubbles on the brain. They're monitoring her saying that they might have to do surgery because of that. And they just have to monitor it. You're in New York. I call you. I was in New York on a you... business trip, selling my bags, my bag line. I was schlepping bags all the way through New York to the Empire State Building doing deals. And I was what I thought doing it. That was it. That was my moment. I had a big, huge ass meeting the next day. And all of a sudden I get the call and I'm looking out of the window in New York and it's snowing outside and I'm at my girlfriend's house watching the snowfall as I get a call from you. Paris fell off her uncle's back. We're at chalk right now. She's had x-rays. I took her to a clinic. It was closed. We tried to go to the next place and we're in the hospital right now. So I had a choice to make family or career. And I chose my family, so I flew all the way home. And my best friend who was supposed to be there at the airport to pick me up never showed up, so I had to take a taxi all the way from Long Beach to Orange to Chalk Hospital to see you in Paris and stay the night. So the good news out of this, <laughs> <laughs> feels like you're going, whoa. <laughs> Debbie Downer. But the thing is, it's like. Come a long way. Look at all the challenges. Yeah. So, you know, the I think the thing for people to get out of this is that there's going to be challenges in life, even on your, you know, it's just not on your way down. It's on your way up. Right. You know, think about Trump, how many lawsuits oh and how much God. stuff he has or Elon Musk or something like that. It's like, there's challenges all the time. People come every day, them. every day of people coming at me. You know, people have, I don't think a lot of people have any idea what those guys go through to have the status that they have. They don't. Um, anyway, you're gonna have some challenges and that's, I don't encourage challenges or I don't say just be looking for challenges, but when challenges do arise, then it's important to know that you're always victorious through Christ, through those things. It's so an opportunity. It's, matter, it's, matter, um, it's an opportunity to grow. Mm -hmm. so just like going to the gym, you put pressure on your muscles, you tear down the muscle fiber. That pressure is what causes development. It's not growth because growth happens automatically you grow as a child without having to do anything except eat pressure is going to what's going to cause development so as you go through these times of pressure you have to look at it from a positive perspective that i'm developing i'm getting better and it's just like us with our business that we've had now going on 25 years every time we run into a challenge or a <laughs> hurdle or an obstacle with a client or a situation or whatever and it's based around our contract what do we do? We make a revision to our contract. We put in another exclusion, another revision, whatever it may be. We talk it through, to, we figure it out. How can we overcome it? How do we not make the same mistake again? How so do we become, cover ourselves? Become better. Right. You, you become more protected right. through that. And it's, un, <laughs> you know, it's too bad that we live in a society now that's so sued crazy that you, know, you have to always be thinking about how do I protect my ass from being sued? So crazy. You know? But my point is that it's through that that it makes you better. It makes you more polished as a business person that you're better protected. And I will say, just from a business perspective, you have you have come full circle. Well, thank you. Back to Paris. <laughs> so you fly in, you're at the hospital. Yeah. We like have, I guess, this oh, moment. <laughs> what are we like? Like, what are we doing? We, we kind of like both doing? realize that, yeah, what are we doing? Um, just to fast forward the story, I pray over Paris within, I think, a day. She's miraculously healed there's they can find no bubbles on the brain Nothing. no fractures She's no anything fine. everything is completely 100 percent restored miraculous go home um you know there's a lot of the things to do for us to finally get to like having our own place because you're still with your parents i was like sharing a place with some friends and so it <laughs> took some time to get that back together um 
But the other testimony about that whole thing is we never received one doctor bill for any of that. Isn't that crazy? None of that. And it wasn't, I mean, I filled out all the paperwork. I put my social security number. I did, it wasn't like I shim sham my way through the <laughs> hospital system. You know, I was like, because signed, back then it would have been questionable. Signed Joe Blow and my social security number is one, two, three. You know, it was me no comprendo, me no speak English. It's like, it just, we never got that anything. We never got anything. Yeah. Never. So, that was miraculous. And just even the way we got out of my parents' house, that was a whole miraculous thing on, you know, once we started, we got back together, we started to make things together as a family. We started to move forward as a family to do things together. Doors started opening. Mm -hmm. um, I sat down with someone in commercial real estate after I'd started the company and he was like, hey, there's this new development that's starting out in Ladera Ranch and I can put your name on the list because I know the developer and I was like that would be that would be great that was just marketing services you know and uh, I came running home and I was like guess what <laughs> we have this opportunity and you're like you're crazy we're never gonna get this and we went and we got it we <laughs> well we'll tell them more details of the story so we went it's Friday <laughs> And this was a time in Southern California, I think it was like 2004 or something like that, 2002 or somewhere in that ballpark when real estate was going nuts. So this was a new development. They were doing a lottery for the houses, basically. So we went and looked at the models. The lady said, there's absolutely, they were doing the lottery the next day. Mm -hmm. They had over three or 400 people on the list. They're only going to give three houses away out of three or 400. And the lady said, you have absolutely no chance in getting a house. <laughs> who said that to you? The lady who was running the whole thing at the model homes or whatever. <laughs> she said that. She did. She was yeah. already trying to get you all tripped up. I knew we were getting a place. Well, thank God somebody had faith because I had absolutely <laughs> you zero. You were so mad. You were, had... you went and sat on a curb away from everybody. And you just sat there like this with your arms crossed. And I was well, up the front waiting that, to hear that, my name. That lady told us that that <laughs> Friday and Saturday morning we're there. And there's like hundreds of people. And it was like there the was one hundreds of people person. So I'm like, I'm not going to go stay on that group. This I was, I was like, this is a complete waste of time. So I did, I went and sat on the curb. And then I think the second name, Angela and Charles Todd. I was like, are you even kidding me? You're like, yeah. <laughs> Like, Hercules, knew, Hercules, knew that's my it. God. And then I remember when we, when we went inside, the lady said to us, the same way it told me, there's no way you're going to get one. She says, we must know some really important people. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know God, baby. That's who I know, my daddy. So yeah, that was a miraculous thing. But you know, what got us to that point to be able to buy a house was you had started a company and we're doing things like you're saying, doors are opening, favor God was taking care of stuff. Um, then I started helping you within the company. That's the company that we had now that we've had for 25 years, but that was the point too. Where I said, okay, we're starting to earn the money again. Right. We're starting to get to this point. I want to do it the right way. And that's when I went online, started looking who teaches on money, what preacher right. preaches on money and who I came up with. Creflo Dada. <laughs> Creflo A dollar. <laughs> he didn't have just a dollar. He had a lot of dollars. He had and and he spoke of dollars. on a lot of dollars too. So we, we used to fly all the way to Atlanta. We used to go to Atlanta to go to church. We not just, like, I mean, we went to every conference they had, every conference they had in College Park, Georgia. Anytime they did something with Kenneth Copeland Ministries, which is how we got turned on to Kenneth Copeland memory, Kenneth Copeland Ministries and the Believers Conventions right. and becoming partners with them. Right. And only becoming partners with them with Jesse DePlace and Jerry Savelle and Keith Moore and all these people that we now They're still listen so to yeah. is that we were flying to go to church on a regular basis, at least once a quarter and all of their conventions and all their conventions that are doing that. And after the first, I think the first time we went there, we had a, we only had a thousand dollars, I think, saved up at this point. Cause we had just bought in that house that we got. It was a condo, it was a little condo, two bedroom, two bath condo. Unit. Yeah. We put our desk. I mean, when we moved out of the office space we had, we put our desk in the hallway. Yeah. We were running the company out of the hallway. Yeah. <laughs> But we had a, I think we had a thousand dollars, like just, I don't know, in our business account or savings. I don't remember what it was, but I spent that entire amount on 
teachings from Creflo Dollar. We had every cassette tape. We had every was, CD. Was ca we cassette, had every DVD. All that. Any, everything on money I bought on all. So we got like, it looked like a dishwasher box came full of all these things. And that's when I started basically just engulfing myself in those teachings. And that's the start of what changed our life right there from a financial perspective. Yeah, I agree. That. Well, not necessarily. I mean, financially, but definitely financially. Like you it said, you started, can... started setting up the biblical foundation. And from there, then, you know, like we were talking about earlier, getting wise counsel and it's, you know, getting good accountants, getting good attorneys, getting people to help you in there, your wealth management. And when you don't really have any wealth to manage, you don't really need a wealth manager. So we really didn't have that. So we had my stepdad who Thank was God telling us like invest, invest, invest for years and years and years. And it probably took like 10 years before I finally started doing what he said. Cause you always think oh, I got enough time or I don't have enough money. So I had to break some of those mindsets yeah. as well too. And you know, so one of the things that we teach people now is that start early from the very beginning. I don't care where you're at. If you're making a hundred bucks a month, whatever it is, a thousand, 10,000 tied off of it, save some of it and invest some of it, no matter how small it is. And if you say, I'm going to, I'm going to do 10% of a hundred dollars. Okay. That's 10 bucks. So out of that 10 bucks, break it up however you want to, you know, but do something or do, do a nickel. Tie the nickel, save a nickel, and it's not really tied if it's not 10%, but we won't get legalistic about it. The point is give, save, and invest because they're all different aspects. So do it no matter how small. The Bible says, he is faithful with little, be faithful with much. It's true. You want know, to flip that around? He who's not faithful with little won't be faithful with much either. So people will say, well, when I get well, rich, when my boat comes in, <laughs> then I'll start to give and I'll start to invest. Guess what? Your boat ain't coming in, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 it's a big old joker because you're just sitting around waiting and it ain't going to happen. Right. And even if it does happen, you ain't going to have the principles or the knowledge or the skills or the discipline to do that because you've never developed them. Right. It's like saying, well, when I get for your 100, 100 pounds, when I get to 200 pounds, then I'll start lifting to get strong. You got to start at 100 pounds to get it to 200 pounds. You got to right. eat and do all the stuff to get to that. <clears throat> so you've got to start developing those disciplines in those areas at the very beginning as soon at as the possible very as beginning. Soon as possible I mean, so that, that's why in our books i mean we have one on one book is all on saving one is all on giving and the other one is the staying out of debt and then money is easy the one that's just talking in general because those are all specific areas that you really have to learn and so, so they those have to be taught to kids as well too because just think of it as a baby this like say this is my toy playing with my toy and somebody else comes along and wants to take my toy. Mine! What do they do? Mine! You, you still do that now. Well, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm a work in progress. He's still learning. My point is... Learning the book on... You giving, don't have giving to... Giving is easy. You don't have... You have to be taught how to give to be, oh, yeah. I graciously at least give this to you. See? You have to be taught to do that. You don't have to be taught how to hold on. You have to be taught how to give. So that's the whole point is that you got to be these taught. Th these things have to be taught. So let me ask you something. Okay. Where do you think we would be if we had these simple principles growing up? If, if mom, if mama and daddy and them read this to us in the womb, where do you think our lives would be right now? I think that they would be similar, but we would just have more. I think that instead of trying to play catch up, we would be in a surplus. Yeah, that's my point. Just, I mean, we yeah. are in a surplus now, but having this. How would that change? I mean, now, I mean, there's a progression. There's seasons that we've gone through. So where you're spending the majority of your time earning your money, running your businesses, doing that type of stuff. And then you get to a point where then we started our foundation, our ministry. And then, so then you start giving back. And what I've seen over that, so that was going to be 17 years, 18 years this year that we've had that is that there's you, there's a shift from the amount of time that you're working to the amount of time that you're putting into your giving back. So you start to work less or you become more efficient in the area of your work. And then you start to give more in that. So my whole focus this last year has really been on investing, like really just having money work for you, saturating myself by and that came from Patrick Betty David. I think it was his five recommended books. I read all five of them and I encourage people 
always be reading. Always be reading. It's so important. I mean, I'm always reading at least one, sometimes three books at one time. It has totally changed sometimes, sometimes, our lives. You're yeah, from reading. A, from an investment perspective. And, you know, that came from my stepfather getting me into that realm. And then once I started saying, okay, what else is there out there? And so through those books that Patrick Betty David recommended, and I just started reading those. And one of them, we'll get some. Uh, links to the books of these that I'm talking about. One was on alternative investment and talked to, it was like 25 of the top alternative investors that all specialize in a specific thing. And I just chewed it up. And then from there I started like, okay, what alternative investments? And I started talking to people and doing stuff. And within, you know, this year period of time, just getting that knowledge from that has changed how Look we're investing happened. our stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it blown up. It's like our, our investment portfolios more than doubled in that year's period. Um, so, you know, getting, getting the information in order to be able to do that. But if we would have had that earlier, then I just think we, we would be giving more time and more money and more of everything to more people because we would have the capacity to start that earlier and at a larger rate. I mean, right. that's what we're always doing. You're always kind of expanding your capacity, you know, expanding your capacity to receive. Right. Enlarge your temp posts. Yeah. And, and expanding that. Yeah. So you just keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. People say, well, why do you need so much or whatever? It's, it's about being able to bless more. Because there's so many needs in the world. Just look around, just open your social media. It's nuts. So I mean, we, we, would, we would just be doing what we're doing right now at a broader scale. Right. You know, and would, would we maybe have already sold our business and moved on to something else? Maybe, I don't know, but I, I like to work. So I'll always work. I won't ever retire. I just, that's not, it's not me. I don't like not to work. I like to be productive. I like to use my mind. I like to help other people. I mean, even just in our business that we have now, how many people that we help as far as providing employment for, you know? And that's one of my things is like, when I think about selling or whatever, exiting, it's like, I think about those people, <laughs> you know? It's like, cause they got a good, they like us. We take care of them, you know? It's like, if we went away, it's like, then they gotta do something. And that's, I mean, it's a cycle of life. And you, and you can't make decisions based on that. But that's something I still think about. I have compassion for the people who have been so such good workers for us, people that we've worked with to help not just develop and grow our company, but to develop them as individuals as well, too. Yeah. You know, it's great to see people grow. I like to see people grow, you know, so. Same way and just the testimonies. Back to testimonies that we have of people that have been healed, delivered, set free, healed of cancers, uh, managing and being robust in their finances, having miraculous breakthroughs, just like the students in the class. So they would all come up to the front and you would just have everyone filled with the spirit and they would all be praying and speaking in tongues over their budgets and over their money. And all of a sudden people were having wisdom they never had before and they were getting out of debt. And it was like a balloon effect. And just popped with all this goodness. It was pretty awesome. But man, you spent so much time, so much time praying over every class and every lesson to get a word specific for that class. It was awesome. Well, and that's, I mean, I think we can get out of that is that's a mindset to be able to apply yourself to whatever it is you're doing. You know, and maybe that's not, you're not teaching a class. Maybe that's just your job. You know, sure. maybe that's if you're being educated, you're going to college or whatever. Maybe that's the, the mindset of just working and applying yourself to your school, to your classes, wherever that is. And I'm not a big fan of college. Um, that's a whole nother podcast that we'll talk about as well too. <laughs> but if you're in that situation, right. it's like apply yourself, you know, right. just don't be partying, partying and partying and just running the muck or doing whatever, put some effort into it, right. you know, and that's going to be anything in life. And I think into, into your life, into your appearance, into your look, present, well, you know, and that's what I'm getting about is just the mindset Represent. of diligence, right. You know, of changing the way people think. And you know th what I hear a lot of times, like I've noticed this on some, I was just on some virtual seminars last week and it's a common thing that I hear from people who are looking to get educated on, looking to pick up a new trade, looking to expand what they're doing in the area of their finances, maybe looking at not being an employee and starting their own business. Is the number one excuse I hear is that I don't have enough time. And anytime 
that you make an excuse, you're just lying to yourself. I say, when you complain, you remain. When you make excuses, you're lying to yourself. So when people say they don't have enough time and they're not successful really within their finances, I would like to take a look at their time management. I bet I can find enough time for them to put in the efforts to do something. Number one thing I'd say, start getting up early. Get up before dark. You should be getting up. You should be praying and getting your mind right, first of all. And then from there, you probably need to work out because a lot of times if people don't work out right away, then it gets lost. Because if they have a job, they have kids, they have family, whatever, and then gets lost. You should get all that stuff done before you even start your day. So if you start your day normally at seven o'clock, you need to get up at four o'clock and get all that stuff done. Period. I mean, we get up at three, three thirty, four thirty every day. We've done that for years. We still do that. And do I work out in the morning? No, I don't because I have the ability because we have our offices in our house and we have a gym in our house. So I can multitask. I can, I like to work out in the afternoon. So I have the convenience that I don't have to leave my being connected to my employees, to my clients or any of that type of stuff. I can work out, still take a call. I can work out. I can watch a teaching. I can do all these things. I can multitask. So it works. For me if i didn't have that i would probably go to the gym right after i had my prayer and i got my mindset every morning i probably go in the morning right away so you have to make adjustments based on what you Your have available to you and also around the obligations or the priorities that you have in your life and so if somebody sleeps in until 8 30 and they get up and they're at work at nine o'clock they just wasted like two or three hours in the morning you take two or three hours times 365 days a year and then convert that to weeks. That's a lot of time you're throwing away. But it could be reading, even if it's just for a half an hour, just to read. Maybe one Bible scripture and maybe one page out of the investment book. Yeah, I mean, How it would for us, we, we spend a couple of hours doing that, you know? And I'm just saying, if you could just take, even if it's five, take five minutes. It takes five minutes but, to open up your Bible app on your phone and to read one Psalm. And that's a great point. It goes right back to what I was talking about. Just start with a little, right. just give a little bit. Just, I mean, so even if this, you know, Joseph Prince has a great app. He's came out with a new app. I'm like texting our family and friends. Hey, Joseph Prince has a new app. I really like it because it has a devotional and it has a short declaration and then it has a short teaching. And you can really basically do all of it in probably 10 minutes or something. Right. So whatever it is, I mean, just have two minutes of prayer time and then just put your clothes on and go walk around the block for five minutes and then go to work. Start with that, right. <laughs> you know, 15 minutes, right. you know, start. And then you will build on that where you start to increase say, hey, you know what, walking around the block kind of actually made me feel good. I had more energy, you know. Just walk to the end of the driveway. I tell my dad, dad, just walk outside. Do something. Just yeah. get, and walk get, get out, get out of the house. Yeah, just get out of the garage. <laughs> just walk down the driveway. Well, sometimes I do that and if I've been working for so long. walk down the street. And then, you know, and then once you start doing that, yeah, it's a process. And then you're like, so the next day that you do it, you're like, I'm going to go two blocks. And then, you know, it's another process. And then a couple of days later, you're like, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go explore a little bit more. And it's true. You just, you, it's what you do. Well, and that's, you know, it's going back to what we're saying. We're working on people changing the way they think. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. It's actually, some of the versions say God, but it's actually, it's actually Christos, it's Christ. Hearing the, hearing the good news of Christ is what makes you faith. When you hear all the good things that Jesus did for you that you can have, it's like, that's what builds your faith. I have faith, not in my own faith. I have faith in what Jesus did for me. So it comes by hearing the same thing. You can say fear comes by hearing too. So when you're constantly bombarding yourself with news and media and all this junk, all this garbage is going to fill you with fear. So then you're going to have out of that, you're going to react in fear. You're going to attach yourself. Job said, the thing that I fear the most has come upon me, which means that those things that I'm fear of and I have anxieties that I'm thinking of, I'm meditating on. Oh my gosh, maybe this is going to happen. Maybe I'm going to catch COVID. Maybe I'm going to be broke because the stock market is down. Maybe this is a down, you know, whatever. Right. They're thinking that they're attaching themselves to those things. So versus if you're hearing good stuff, then you're going to be experiencing those good things because that's what you're meditating. That's where your faith is going to come from. Thank God for technology. But if we had access to information when we were growing up to what is now, like our children in the world, like even with Paris and the technology and the apps and the things that she was exposed to, 
and how that's advancing more and more and more. I mean, as parents, and this is a whole other thing we could talk about. I was gonna about. say, you know, that's a great podcast to have, actually get somebody like a parent or a specialist who teaches on it, because I have no idea how to tell people how to, uh, how to properly manage like technology with your kids, because we didn't have to deal with that with Paris. Yeah, we did. Are you oh. kidding? I was, that was my job. Okay, well that's fine. I was I all up in trying to figure out her passwords, what she was logging on to, who she was FaceTiming, and she, remember when we had the casita and she would go up there with her computer and I guess talk to boys, and I was <laughs> okay. like, oh, hell no. And then she like tried to move her stuff up there. She tried to move out of the house okay, and into the have, guest house. I was gonna have you <laughs> on the podcast to talk about this stuff, because obviously you have some experience that I didn't know about, so. You can lock your phones, there's parental, um, you know, settings that you can do for your children's phones, but that doesn't, prevent them from going somewhere else to another kid that doesn't have that on their phones because you, if you want to, you're always gonna find a way to do that. How do we get on this for mindsets? <laughs> Where are we going? <laughs> We're talking about technology and if we had had, just being exposed oh, yeah. to information, information. you know. Okay. But right. here's another thing, you have to be involved in your children's life. You have to be connected to your children and raising them and showing them the way. You have to be present. And I think that's why we're so such a close family is because we're always present with each other. Like we always yeah. want to know what's going on in each other's lives, even though Paris will sometimes be like, mom, dad, you know, she's got this thing, like why? Like, you know, of course everyone needs their time, but we're also like, I smell something, what's going on, you know? And for me, just praying, this is why it's so important to be a praying parent, is because you will be led by the Spirit to check something that you would never normally check. And when I tell Paris this, she's like, yeah, I don't know how you knew that. Well, I had no idea, but I, like a Spirit of God, I remember being in a dead sleep. I was on the couch and I, I literally woke up like this, went to the computer and started like, I had no idea what I was doing. And then all this feed started to pop up where she was with one of those bad tennis girls and they were shopping and one of them was shoplifting and they were going back and forth on, you know, how she, how this other girl was gonna put this underneath her clothes and walk out of the store. And I freaking called Paris. I said, you put that back right now. You are rich. There is no way you need to be in a store and stealing anything because you have the money to do it. And don't allow someone to, inf oh, I was going off. And she was like, <laughs> how did you know this? Like, how did you know this? I didn't. There's I mean, a lot of stuff you don't know that I. Thank God. I was yeah. <laughs> blinded by that. <laughs> that was my department. I would have shot somebody. Oh my God. <laughs> so back to your mindset. But back to being involved in your children's lives and actually praying. What you're going you're gonna to get out of. I mean, when I see kids that are <laughs> jackasses, I'm going to say jackasses, right? Because jackass in the Bible. Well, whatever. When, yeah. I, when I hear, when I see kids are jackasses, typically it's a direct indicator that their parents aren't putting any time with their parents are probably jackasses too. That's not necessarily true because Paris was a total jackass. Well, that's true. And we too. had parents grab her by the neck, I mean, and bring her back to us, like her piano teacher. She grabbed, had her by the neck out her front door and said, she's unteachable, I can't do this. I think this. those were more isolated incidents where it wasn't like... She was still an constant. asshole. <laughs> <laughs> we were using the word jackass. <laughs> this is a... <laughs> <laughs> Biblical well, podcast. Here. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> she was. Anyway, we were young parents, but we were still. I mean, we were shocked. I mean, like when she got kicked out of freaking school, or we pulled her out of school, and you know, she's cussing on the campus, and we're like, "What do you mean she's cussing on the campus?" And okay, Paris is gonna be really <laughs> upset when she sees this because we're bringing out all of her. So we're talking about mindset. But Look at how far we've come is yeah, the whole part, point. Yeah, it's part of the challenges and it's like, you, you know, you can look at us now and say, oh my gosh, you guys have all this, you have a business and you have a ministry and you have all this stuff. You have houses and exotic cars and all this and it must be just like roses and Cracker Jacks and popcorn and all these good things and <laughs> cotton candy at the beach. And it's been a lot it's of like this. There's still stuff going on. There's five know? pounds of an ounce, baby Jesus, <laughs> help me. But we're talking about mindset right. and just, I think, 
you know what that mindset leads in is to, to, to diligence, okay. you know, and how you have to be diligent. And even after you have success is still staying within those diligent ways of operating in your life, still maintaining those mindsets, still doing the same things. It's like before we were doing this, I was still like going through numbers in our budget. Do I need to do a budget? No, I don't need to budget, you know, but I still do because it's something that I did back when I had to, when I had the budget, because if you didn't, then you didn't get all the bills paid and you get to a place where you, you can just pay your bills every time they come in. You don't even have to think about it, but it's still, it's, it's a diligency of operating the area of your finances right. of doing that and just tracking. It's not so much as from a budgeting perspective, but it's just a track. It's just a mindset. It's a, okay. it's a something that you do and you maintain those, but you have to put those into place. If you could have, if there was one thing people could start on, give me one thing, how to get from there to here. Like one thing to do. Whatever, what comes to your mind? What's the very first thing that comes to mind? If there's one takeaway from getting from, you know, we were in Lodabar, we were in the negative. After being bankrupt, we owed money. We were in negative to being into the millions, having surplus. How do you go from there to here? Third John two. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper, be in health just as your soul prospers. So what does that mean? So he's saying, I want you to prosper. I want you to be in health and I want your soul to prosper. How do, what's your soul? Okay. Your so, so we're, we're made up. We're a three part being We're a spirit, a body and a soul. The soul is made up of your free will, your emotions and your mind. So that's one part of it. Your spirit who is more real that you can't see is more real than even your body. Like when I put this shirt on and I walk around, this shirt goes with me. If I take the shirt off my body and hold it like this and I drop it, what happens? It falls to the ground. It doesn't have any structure to it. It can't do anything. The shirt can't do anything of its own. The same thing is with our spirit. Our spirit is what gives life to the body. Without our spirit, you take the spirit out of the body, the body drops to the ground. That's why if somebody gets shot, they fall to the ground. Their spirit's still alive, spirit leaves the body, but the body is dead. The soul then is what is affected. The mind, the free will is what is expected, is in, affected by the spirit. So when you're putting spiritual messages, teachings on prosperity, health, wholeness, all those type of things, it's going to change your soul. It's going to change the way you think. And so once you start to change the way that you think, that's when you'll start to have manifestation of things happening in your life. Because those new ways of thinking, those right ways of thinking are going to change how you act, what you do, your diligence and all those things. So I would say that would be the most important thing. Engulf yourself with like teachings, like what we did, you know, from the very beginning, listening to messages when you get up, listen to messages when you're driving in your car, listen to messages when you're working out, listen to messages while you're going to bed, playing those things all night long. Get an iPad, get a phone, get a whatever, plug it in, put it on repeat of a message or you even can go, at night can, we have you can go silking on, music you can go on, on youtube during, in the night time you know just whatever it is it's going all night because the bible says that god never sleeps nor slumbers never goes to sleep so the bible also says that the same spirit that rose jesus christ from the dead is in you so you have the same spirit so your spirit never sleeps nor slumbers so if you're constantly feeding yourself from a spiritual perspective guess what you can still get revelation in your soul while you're sleeping even. So good. You, you can still have prophetic dreams. You can still have those things. And one of the things that- I've been having a whole week of prophetic dreams. Well, it's because you're taking these new peptides maybe. But. <laughs> Holy cow, like, wait a minute. Did that really happen? But the, the point is that, you know, one of the things, one of my declarations that I make before I go to bed is, thank you, Lord, that you will minister to my soul, that I will have prophetic dreams from you and prophetic message from you and you right. only. You know, I'm expecting. Right. God to speak to That's me. I'm, I'm expecting my spirit to yeah. basically infect my soul right. from a good way that even while I'm sleeping, I still will Being get benefit. To, yeah. yeah. I'm still going to, still going to prosper my soul. So said all that to say, get your soul to prosper. And you do that through listening, reading, whatever those things. Cause that's truly what changed our lives. Right. Period. 
And once you start, once you get that foundation, then you can start to add all the other components of everything for success. That's how you do it. You have a different relationship with money. You're not going after money. So it's like what Matthew six talks about. It's the seek ye first, my kingdom, my righteousness, and all these things come after you basically. And what does it talk about before that's talking about not worrying. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about these things. It said, do the birds worry? No, the birds don't worry. You know, does my animal kingdom, they don't worry. They know they're going to be taken care of. If a bird doesn't worry about that, he's going to be fed by God. Shouldn't you not worry either? But yet people worry all the time about not having enough. That's because they open up their phone. (laughs) (laughs) They need to till the land. (laughs) <laughs> they need to till their own land, man. <laughs> well, we were given responsibility to do that. I mean, Adam was. He's supposed to tend the garden, man. Yeah. He blew it. So listening to this today, it's like people's souls are prospering. Right. You know, it's just, it's that simple. Right. It really is that simple. And then things will start to change. And then, you know, once you get those right beliefs in you, then, you know, that's when favor of God goes to work in your life. Yeah. Bible says that favor surrounds me like a shield. Right. It's like, you know, that he opens doors that no man can shut. Amen. You know, so it's like you have opportunities that other people wouldn't have. You have favor, not because you kissed somebody's butt or did something, you know, for them to try to get favor. Your favor comes from God. Right. It's a whole different ball game. Right. You know, and you start to believe that you expect things to happen for you. Right. You expect good things. You expect to prosper. You expect to be healthy. You expect to be protected. You expect to be, have all the goodness of God, all the promise. You expect them to be at work in your life, but you have to know them. You know, if you don't know what those things are because you don't go and get knowledge of that and study it, then you don't know anything. It's just, I like to use this testament. I had, I've had seven Corvettes now. I'm done with Corvettes, I think. So I've been three Lamborghinis. Yeah, now. I don't think you're ever going to be done with Corvettes. But anyway, it's like, I think now. it was the sixth one I had. I never opened the manual. So I thought, this is my sixth Corvette. I never think about Corvettes. I don't need to read the manual. I know everything. What's the manual? The manual is the basically gives the operating instructions from the manufacturer for that car. It's going to tell you everything you need to know on how to properly operate that car. So did you really know the car? Well, apparently not because I went to sell it. The guy who came and got it, he got in the test drive and he started pushing these buttons and doing that. I was like, whoa, what was that? How did you do that? So the car did things that I didn't even know because I didn't take the time to read the manual. So I had paid for these options. (laughs) <laughs> and I never got to enjoy them the whole time I had the car. So I sold the car and Ooh. never got to experience the options that were given to me by the manufacturer because I didn't read the manual because I thought I knew it all about the cool van. I didn't know Jack. So know. what I learned from that, that was, this is the revelation I had is that it's the same way people go through life. Even Christians, they go through life. And they don't know the promises of God because they don't take the time to open up the Bible and to read those things or to hear messages about what they have been given. That he paid for you to have. That he paid. And he's what he said. on the inside of you saying, I paid for it. It is finished. When he said it's finished, that means you got it all. All your sins are forgiven. You got it all. It's done. You don't have to plead. You don't have to cry. You don't have to beg. You don't have to do anything. Just like when Paris comes to her house, she just opens the fridge, does whatever. She takes the car, keys the car. Give me the car. I was like, you can't do that because don't give me the keys to the car. You know, it's just, she takes because she knows that it's hers and that I want to gladly give her all those things too. There's no restrictions for she's our child. She's our heir. It's the same way. We're a joint heir of Jesus Christ. God's the same way. He's like, I've already paid for all this. My son paid for all of this for you to have. And so you have to know what's yours so that you can take and you can enjoy it. If you don't know what you have, you don't get to enjoy it. I remember uh, George from Kid a Couple of Minutes told a story about a guy who was homeless and lived under a bridge in, I think it was the UK, died, he froze to death, and he was an heir to $300 million. Oh man. Homeless, died in the cold was an heir. He just never knew. Why didn't he? he? So guess because he didn't know, guess what? He couldn't live in a nice house with a heater and sustain his life. He lost his life because of what did we talk about earlier? Hosea four, six, my people perish because lack of knowledge. knowledge. He didn't know he had an inheritance. So he died. He physically died. 
So Christians, people, don't even have to be a Christian. I mean, if you don't know anything, if you're whatever religion, whatever, if you don't know what is yours, guess what? You die without being able to experience it. It's crazy. And it's already been given to you. And it's in the manual. The manual, the Bible is the manual to life that was going right. to tell you how you can enjoy these things. So Jerry Savelle Ministries. Love Jerry Savelle. I'll leave you. Here's my final nugget for you. The Lord is orchestrating unexpected acts and showering you with his delightful surprises. Amen. I receive that. Amen. I love surprises. I know. <laughs> orchestrating unexpected acts, showering you delightful surprises. That's good. Amen. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. That's all. Period. And I love you. Thank you. Yeah. So it's to answer your question, get that soul going, baby. <laughs> get some soul. Get your mind going. Holy soul that's, change. That's, that's, yeah. you know, the number one. Get this thing. information in your kids, man. Yeah. Get it in your kids. It has to come. Oh. Just read to the womb. And if you don't have a kid, someone's got a kid. Someone yeah. in the world's got a kid. Neighbor's got a kid. You're yeah, an aunt and an uncle. Kid, yeah. You're, it's always a kid. So we can change generations by doing so you know, the stuff that we're talking about. Yeah. So go to Amazon, get the books help somebody out. We're going to be talking a lot more about all kinds of stuff within the family, marriages, the kids. It's all going to be really pretty candid. Yeah. But, but we're not holding anything back, but based around finances, right? You know, how, how, not just how you can help your kids, but how you and your spouse can work through situations with right. money, how talking about, you know, the school systems, and we're going to get deep into, <laughs> A lot of this yeah. stuff because it all affects you. So you need to have some knowledge, right. and some understanding about it. Just listen to our story of what not to do <laughs> and how we that's... overcame. Yeah. How we overcame. You can get more information on our website at toddworldwide.org. Yep. All about the books, all about whatever. So some Money Mike in the game dot com. You can go to Amazon. You can go anywhere. Yeah. All good. Till next time. The abundant life. Amen. Amen. Peace, baby. Hey, kids, it's Money Mike. I'm lean, I'm green, and I'm a money machine. Welcome to my new book, Money is Easy, where I branch out with glee, revealing the message, money is as easy as counting one, two, three. This is my first book in the Money Mike in the Gang four-book series, where I get together with my good friends and reveal hidden secrets in my tree leaves that pay dividends. I'll teach you three simple steps on how to get rich so you can tell a friend and also help their lives to be enriched. So check out my new book and you will see that money really is easy. As easy as counting one, two, three.